Okay, so we've been looking at uh, so we can see in finite fields. So just quickly recap uh, what we saw so far. So we saw that a finite field has to have p power m elements for p being prime, and then we saw that it's essentially unique. Okay. Okay. And we saw a construction for it. And for this construction, we need power of x, which is one a reducible polynomial in uh, z dx, uh, degree m. And then we saw that we could construct of p power m mass polynomials. Polynomials with coefficients in ZP of degree less than or equal to m minus one. Okay, and when you do multiplication modulo by f x, you get a field. And then we saw that this field has a primitive element. Okay, so the same p power m can be written as zero, one, alpha, alpha squared, all the way to alpha power p power m minus two. Okay, there exists alpha such that this is true. So this is a primitive element. Okay. So if you have a method for going back and forth between the alpha representation and the polynomial representation, you can do addition very easily in the polynomial representation. You can do multiplication very easily in the alpha power representation. So it works out. Okay. So this is how you construct and work with the field of size p power n. So the only thing here is how do you find this p of x? Phi of x? And uh, there are tables available for any reasonable m, but you can also have write and write a program to find uh, find uh, this kind of irreducible or primitive polynomials even. Okay, so so I don't know if you're familiar with these things. There's something about how many primes are there in the first n natural numbers, roughly. How many are there? In, the, in terms of numbers, how many prime numbers are there from say one to n, roughly? Do you know of any result like that? So go back and look at it. So it turns out it's a fairly it's just some number of it between n and 2n. There are some some primes expressed. So there are some results like that you can use to figure out that if you randomly come up with numbers in a certain way, then you can get to prime numbers. So similarly, there is methods to find irreducible polynomials of degree m. So if you keep picking random coefficients for your polynomials, of course, making sure that you don't make obvious mistakes. In the in the thing, for instance, if you keep the constant coefficient as zero all the time, you'll never get a reduced polynomial. Right? So you, so you don't do some obvious mistakes like that. You pick every co coefficient randomly, you do something like that. It turns out you'll get an irreducible polynomial soon enough. So you can write a program like that to to find that. So since it's since that is true, one can even write a program to quickly come up with this polynomial. So so the construction and the operations of the finite field are used to be clear. And uh, there are some lot of structural results that we saw about. Of what smaller fields will be contained in FP power m? Okay, those things are those things are interesting just to give you a structure. And then the next thing we saw was about minimal polynomials. Okay, so that was an important uh, kind of uh, idea. Okay, so we saw that all the elements of the finite field are roots of x bar p power m minus x. Okay, so that is the result that we saw, and that was a crucial result which tied up everything together. And then we saw that it's in fact x bar p power m minus x is a product of all irreducible polynomials in ZPX whose degree divides m. Okay, so that was an interesting uh, result as well. And then we saw minimal polynomials for each of these elements. And so, so finally, all that was basically tuned towards finding roots of a polynomial with coefficients from a finite field. Okay, what is the main result about roots of polynomials with coefficients from finite fields? There is an extension field of the finite field over which this polynomial factors into well, yeah, linear factors up to with multiplicities, but basically linear factors. Okay, so we know that there is a splitting field for every polynomial. How do you find that field? You take its degree and then work and see which p power m minus one it will divide, and then once you see that, you can figure out which uh, which field will have. So there's a way to easily do it. So one can one can do that for any polynomial. Okay, so that that's that kind of 
I mean, that's that's a nice way of studying all that you want to know about the field, right? So usually in a field, we're interested in finding roots for a polynomial. So so that's that's that gives you some closure kind of thing. Okay, so you know how to find roots for every polynomial. You, you pretty much studied most of the algebraic properties of the field. Okay, beyond that, you're not too interested. Okay. So one crucial idea that I didn't emphasize too much in the class itself, but in the problem set it showed up and I explained briefly how to do it, is this notion of factoring x bar n minus 1 over so px. Okay, so let's spend some time on this. This is quite important in our in something else that we're going to study, you'll see that this will show up as an important factor. Okay. So how do you factor x bar n minus 1 over z px? Okay. So the first thing is, uh, one condition you will need is to say n and p should be relatively prime. Okay, so this is a notation to say that GCD. So this is basically GCD of n and p. Okay. So so we'll assume that n and p are relatively prime. If n and p are not relatively prime, what do you do? For instance, if n is p times k, what can you do? Yeah, so you can, yeah, so it's very easy to, let's see, you know that x plus y whole part p is the same as x bar p plus y part p. So if it's, if it's, if n is a uh, multiple of p, you can write it as x bar k minus 1 whole raised to the part p. It was in minus 1 to the part p is when it's odd, it's odd like minus again. But it's even in even minus and plus are the same, so it doesn't matter. Okay, so it's, it's always possible to break it down to a point where n and p are relatively prime. So only from there you have to worry about roots. Up to that point, it's just multiplicities. Okay, so, so the multiple root multiplicity keeps going. Okay, so you can always assume that n and p are relatively prime. So once you say n and p are relatively prime, it turns out there exists m such that n divides p power n minus one. Okay, so this is a result which needs proof, but it's it's quite easy to prove. It's not very hard because if you take all the numbers that are relatively prime to p less than p, they will form a multiplicative group. You can show that. Once they form a multiplicative group, you can use some properties from there, and then you can show it. That's, that's the Fermat's uh, little theorem or something like that. Okay, so there's, there's a very standard result which says there will be an m such that n will divide p power m minus 1. Okay, so it's not very hard to show, but we're not going to prove it in this class, but accept that. Okay, so once you accept it, things become much nicer. Okay, so once you say n divides p power m minus 1, this implies there exists some beta n of p power m such that order of beta equals n. Okay, so that is the crucial idea. Here. Okay, so you have an element in F P par n for order order of that element is equal to n. How do you find that element? How do you find this element beta in F P par n? Find the primitive element. So you know it's always a primitive element, and then what? Yeah, what is that i? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, p power m minus 1 by n. Okay, so you take the primitive element, then raise it to the power p power m minus 1 divided by n. So that will be an element which has order n. Okay? Alright? So that, that, that's always true. So once you have this, it's easy to see that x power n minus 1 has to be equal to x minus p power times x minus p power square. So on to x minus beta power n minus 1 times x minus beta power n. But what is that x minus beta power n? It's actually one. Okay. So how do you show that this is equal? Okay. How do you prove this result? Why? Yeah. Yeah. So so we argue is beta is the root of x bar n minus one. So x minus beta divides x bar n minus one, and then beta square is also a root of x bar n minus one, and beta square is not equal to beta. Why is that? Yeah, so, so 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 x minus beta and x minus beta square are mutually relatively prime factors of x bar n minus one. They have no common factor. So it means x bar x minus beta times x minus beta square will have to divide x bar n minus one. So that way you show all the product of everything on the right hand side has to divide x bar n minus one. And then it's a very simple observation about equating the degrees on both sides to show that this has to actually actually be an equality. It cannot be just divide. Okay, so x, x bar n minus 1 of course, of course has degree n, this also has degree n, 
So this is the only other factor you can have there is a constant, and a constant has to be a one by equating the coefficients of x bar. Okay, so it's a very easy thing to show that these two have to be equal. Okay, once you make this argument of order, right? So what we've shown here is the splitting field of x bar n minus one can be quite easily found. You just simply look at the smallest m for which p bar m n divides p bar m minus one, and there it is going to split. Okay. The next step, okay, so I am interested, so this is this is nice, it is very good, you factor it, but the only problem is, this is a factorization over f p par m x, okay, while I was interested in the factorization over z p x, okay, okay, so that was, a, so, so that is the next step, so for that you have to use ideas of minimal polynomials, okay, you know that this element beta has some conjugates in f p par m, and the conjugates and elements beta, when you do x minus beta, x minus beta, beta square, beta beta pi, beta pi, beta pi square, etc. and multiply them together, you actually get a polynomial which is the minimal polynomial of beta in f p par m and that polynomial has coefficients only from z, okay, so that is what you want. So, you want to group the powers of beta as conjugates and then get to the minimal polynomials by multiplying them out and that way you would have factored x bar n minus 1 and to irreducible factors over z p x. So, you know each of the minimal polynomials are irreducible. Okay, so, that is like prime factorization of x bar n minus 1. Okay, we are able to do that. Okay, so, that is the next step and for that we are going to introduce uh, a, a slightly different kind of cyclotomic process. Okay. So, remember when you, when you want to list out conjugates you do not have to carry the main term there. Right? You are only going to find conjugates of beta, with powers of beta. So, I can simply drop beta and only use the powers. Okay. So, I am going to define cyclotomic process modulo n under multiplication by p. Okay. So, what do I do? First of all, I try to find the cyclotomic process of 0, that is going to be 0 by itself. Okay. So, this corresponds to the set of conjugates which are beta bar 0. Okay. And that is what? Basically 1. Okay, so x minus 1. So x minus 1 is a factor and you know and that occurs by itself. That is a minimal polynomial of 1. This is beta bar 0. And then what do you do for C1? You have to do 1 P P square so on. Okay, so it might repeat or it might stop, who knows. Okay, so you are doing modulo n and this will correspond to beta, beta bar P, beta bar P square so on. Okay, this will be the minimal polynomial of so basically this corresponds to the polynomial x minus 1, this corresponds to the minimum polynomial m beta of x. The next step what do you do? You look at a number that does not shown up in the previous things and find the minimal polynomial of that, find the cyclotomic coset of that, sorry, okay. So what you can show likewise is this uh, result that we had before, the cyclotomic cosets, remember this will be modulo m, okay, modulo m, okay, the cyclotomic cosets. Or a former partition of 0, 1, 2, and minus 1. Okay, so you can show the similar result as we did before. Okay, so so you understand what I am saying, right? So when I say partition, what do I mean? Union of all those things is equal to 0, 1, and minus 1. And then what is the next thing that is implied by the partition? Yeah, they are, they are either equal or this one. Okay, so, if you take any two cyclotomic process, they will be either fully the same or they will be distant. Okay, so, so, you can throw away, so you can throw away repetitions and only take one representative and you can get a disjoint union of cyclotomic process which equals 0, 0 to n minus 1. Okay, so, the best thing to illustrate this is an example. Let us take a simple example and take n equals 9. Okay, so, let us look at the cyclotomic process for 0, that will be just 0. Okay, and then 1 is going to be, so let us say uh, p equals 2. Okay, so, p equals 2. 1 is going to be what? 1, 2, 4, 8, and then are you going to get everything? That seems a bit odd. No, no, no. Yeah, you won't get 7, and then 5. That's it. Okay, so you get 6 elements. Okay, and then what is remaining? C3 is remaining, so that will be 3, 6, that is it. Okay. So, here is the disjoint, disjoint partition of 0 to 8, 
through cyclothymic cross sets. You have 0, you have 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 4, 5, 7, 8, and then 3, comma 6. Okay. So this is the cyclothymic uh, cross set decomposition. So what, is, what it means is, what does it mean? It means that if you find an element beta in some F2 theorem such that order of beta equals 9, then what can you do? x bar n plus 1 will factor as x plus 1 corresponding to c0. And then there will be a factor which is x plus beta bar 3 times x plus beta bar 6. Okay, and that will be corresponding to c3. But you know what, what, what will this product be? It has to be x square plus x plus 1. Why should it be x square plus x plus 1? Mm -hmm. That's the only irreducible polynomial of degree 2 in, in f 2 So this will be x square plus x plus 1. That is just something that you can find. Okay. And then what will be the third term? Okay. So x plus beta times x plus beta squared plus times x plus beta per 4 times x plus beta per 5 times x plus beta per 7 times x plus beta per 8. Okay, so this guy is going to be the minimal polynomial of, this will correspond to C1 and it's the minimal polynomial of beta. Okay, and what will be its degree? 6. Okay, so you know its degree is going to be 6. Okay, so this is how it works. Okay, so I think I did this in last class also, in Monday also I did it with, with, with explicit beta. What was the explicit beta that we found? We found beta to be equal to alpha plus 7, where alpha is a primitive element of what? So you have 64, right? So we took that field and we found a primitive element and we found beta explicitly and then I found the minimal polynomial of alpha plus 7. Okay. So this cyclotomic process multiplication by 2 modulo n simplifies all that. Okay. So you can, without even finding out which field contains beta, you can quickly find out the degrees of the minimal polynomials for each uh, element, right? So you don't have to go do that next step. So anyway, this is what's going to work out, right? Anyway, you're going to find only conjugates for beta. You're not going to find conjugates for some alpha. Only for beta, powers of beta. So you can deal with beta itself directly, and you can drop the beta from your notation, and you get this. All right? So maybe I'll do one more example. Just to try from the point. Uh, what n shall we take? Let's take something like say n equals n. We'll take p equals 3. Okay? Right? So how do you find cyclotomic cosets? You have C0, which is 0 by itself. And I hope this is not too trivial. Okay, C1 is going to be 1, then what? 3, 9, that's it. 7, 8. Is that okay? Okay. Remember, it's modulo. 10, okay, so 7 times 3 is 21, that modular 10 brings you back to 1, okay. And what about C2? 2, 6, 2, 4, no, 2, 6, no, 6, 8, 4, am I right? That's it. And then 5 will occur by itself. Am I right? Okay, 5 times 3 is 15, both factors. Okay, so if you factor x bar n minus 1 over z3x, you are going to get x minus 1 as one factor. What is going to be x minus beta bar 5? It is a irreducible polynomial of degree 1. What is the other irreducible polynomial of degree 1? x minus 2. Okay, so it is going to be x minus 1 times x minus 2 times a minimal polynomial of degree 4, another minimal polynomial of degree. Okay, so irreducible polynomial degree 4, irreducible polynomial degree 4. It's a bit difficult to figure out what they are directly. You know. so if you know the list, you can maybe figure out what they are. Okay. So let's see what will be the M, what will be the extension field over 3 in which you will have a order 10 element. 4, right. So you say 3 power 4 minus 1 is 80, 10 divides 80. So you can go to an explicit GF uh, 3 power 4, 30, 81. Then work with the minimal polynomials there and find these polynomials explicitly. If you want to find them out, you can do computations in G of 81 and figure it out. Is that okay? So this is how you work it, but you cannot, you don't have to do that. Okay. The main thing I want to emphasize is you can find the degrees of the minimal polynomials without knowing anything about the field. 
right? Only with this simple cyclotomic process algebra, this computations, you can find the degrees, okay? And it will turn out that is important for us for some other reason, okay? The explicit polynomials also have to be found. If they have to be found, you go to the field extension field and do the computation. But the, if you are only interested in the degree, you can find without any problem. Is that okay? All right. So that's the that's kind of uh, point where we're going to stop looking at finite fields and then move on to uh, codes once again. If there's any question, please go ahead and ask it. Uh, is that correct? With the degree of? Okay. So the claim is you're saying the degree of m beta of x is always equal to the number of elements less than the order and relatively prime to what? To to the order. Huh? Is that correct? It's is that correct? So, so here if you take uh, yeah 1, 3, 7 and 9 so I don't know if you should get all the numbers that's the only thing I am thinking of will it have to come uh, so sometimes it may not you know so it depends on whether or not uh, 2 or 3 the, the prime p is the is a primitive element in in the in what is that the Z n star you know what what you know what Z n star Z n star basically so if you take all the numbers from Z one to n minus one which are relatively prime to n you put them in a multiplicative group modulo n you can do that that is the proper multiplicative group okay and that element depends on whether or not p is primitive if if your prime p is primitive in that then you will get everything in that thing but if, if in case p is not primitive in that you may not get and i don't know if in general every prime p is a primitive element in every set and stuff that may not be so you, you might have exceptions i mean you might be able to quickly find the p equals to itself in some case uh, is it necessary so for instance if you take uh, if you take p equals 2 n equals 15 right Right? If you take p equals 2, n equals 15, you will have only 4 as the degree. Okay? Right? And I think there are more than, there are in fact 8 uh, numbers which are less than 15 and relatively prime to it. You always make a statement when r10 is also a prime number. So the only thing you can say is it will divide what is called c of n. c of n is the number of numbers less than n relatively prime to it. The oil of function. If you divide the oil of function, it's the only thing you say. It may not be equal. It depends on whether or not it's primitive. So, so for instance, the example I gave you: if you take p equals two and n equals fifteen, you get only four. On the other hand, you have eight. P of fifteen is eight. Okay, eight numbers. Okay. Any other question? Is it all right? Okay, so we are going to go back to codes once again. So let me see if you remember our point of departure and getting into finite fields. Why did we get into finite fields? Where did I depart from binary linear block codes? And I gave you a reason. We were constructing some codes and I gave you a reason for code construction which will take us towards finite fields. What was that reason? Yeah. Minimum this yeah, D equals 5 and greater, right? So up to D equals 4, we saw that we could optimally construct some nice codes in binary field. But we could never co construct a code with d equals 5. We never had a nice algorithm for doing it. <coughs> and it was not obvious that how you guarantee d equals 5. So that was our kind of a point of departure. And we said the one reason why you study finite fields, there are several reasons. One reason is to see whether we can come up with constructions for parity check matrices over finite fields, over extension fields of the binary field, that d equals 5 and all can be guaranteed. So it turns out it's true and that was kind of like the starting point of everything, you know, I mean that's why finite fields became important and all that. The construction of that code, it goes back to Bose Choudhury and Hockenham, you know, I don't know how to exactly to pronounce the third name, but PCH. Okay, so that construction really started everything, okay. So what I'm going to do is to provide that construction first in a kind of a high level and then tell you why the minimum distance property comes and then we'll go, go back and look at some more fundamental results about these codes, okay. So, what we are going to study next is basically BCH codes, okay, 
and their construction, mostly from a constructive point of view. And then we'll see more properties. In fact, tensor BCH codes are a special class of what are called cyclic codes. And we'll study cyclic codes in more generality and see how it works out. Okay, so we'll see that later. But for now, we'll begin with the BCH codes construction. Okay, so it's also historically accurate, and on top of that, it's also a very nice, simple, and elegant construction, which is very powerful. There's really no other construction which uh, beats the BCH codes construction in, in, in many ways. Okay, so it's a very nice construction to know. Okay. So, so remember what the definition was. Let's go back to our uh, linear block code. Suppose we have a linear. Uh, so, so I'm going to define binary BCH codes for now. We'll go back to non-binary later. And maybe even, uh, maybe even something else. Okay, so we'll do that. Uh, maybe even non-binary. So I don't know. So, so let's 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 think about uh, codes. So if you have a linear block code with the parity check matrix H. So, all right. So, 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 so there is a way to relate minimum distance to edge, right? So, what is the definition of minimum distance? The minimum distance okay, from its definition equals what? Minimum number of problems that are yeah. So that is important. That are linearly. So you had a problem in your exam, for instance, that this H was defined over GF16, and the way, way to go about doing that is to find the minimum number of columns which are linearly dependent. That problem was really, really simple. There are only two rows. So once you do elimination and get it to I, it's easy to see that there should be three columns that are linearly dependent, and no two columns will be linearly dependent. That will require some proof. You have to, you have to look at it, and it's easy to check the box, check differently. So you can do that. For simple cases, you can do that. Okay. But in general, we want to be able to use this definition and construct a suitable hedge in which something like this can be guaranteed. You can find based on the construction of hedge uh, a number B such that lesser than or equal to less than B columns of H are always linearly independent. That's what I want to guarantee okay, in my construction. I'm going to use finite fields for that. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll construct a parity check matrix from some finite field GF P par M. Okay. So let's not worry about the code for now. We'll simply construct the parity check matrix from some finite field GFP par M or for simplicity maybe even GF2 par M. It doesn't matter where we try to construct it from some GFP par M for which I will be able to give such a guarantee. I'll be able to guarantee that there is a number D okay, such that or less than D columns of H are always linearly independent. Okay, so that's my first uh, starting point. I'll just give you the construction. There's no way to derive the construction. I'll just give you the construction and we'll see why that is true. Okay. It's a very simple result. We'll see that. Okay. So, so for that, uh, we need some starting points. So, let's say n is the block length. Okay. So, block length is basically this determines the number of columns of H. Okay. So, that I need. Okay. So, I need to know how many columns will be there in H. Okay. Total number of columns. And now, I want to come up with a construction. So, for that, first thing I'll need is I'll need an element beta in some finite field. Let's say FP per M. Doesn't matter. So we need uh, so so you so we, this is always possible. This is it's not very hard. Such that order of beta is greater than n. Okay, so that's just some number. So it's always possible, right? So for any n, you can always find a finite field large enough such that there will be an element of order which is greater than n. In fact, equal to n itself is possible. I mean, why not? Greater than n is possible. So every p is possible. So you just pick m large enough so that p par m is greater than n. That's the simplest thing you can do. And then take the primitive element of the field. That will be that will satisfy this. But you don't have to necessarily take primitive. There are so many other elements which have order greater than n. Okay. So I'll start with this beta, and my construction will be using this beta. Okay. That's the first thing. So let's say order of beta is greater than n. The next thing I'm going to do is the following. Okay. So I'm going to say my h will look like this. Okay, first row is going to be 1 b bar b bar squared from b bar bar n minus 1. Okay, the next row is going to be 1 b bar squared b bar squared squared from b bar squared h to the power n minus 1. Okay, so all the way down to 1 b bar power b minus 1 beta power b minus 1 whole square 
go on to beta power d minus 1 whole to the power n minus 1. This is my construction. Okay. So this is this you can call as a DCH construction for a parity check matrix. Okay. So we can call it DCH construction. And it turns out in this matrix, the claim is d minus 1 or fewer columns. are linearly independent. Okay, so what is the punchline and I am giving it to you at the very beginning and we will prove it. Proof is also quite easy and the construction is also quite simple. I mean, if you think about it, it is it's, it's generic, you can use it for, for any D you want, right. So, it is a very simple generic construction, very easy to come up with. So, for instance, in your quiz, the construction followed exactly this logic. Right? You can see that the question had the first word was 1 alpha alpha square alpha power 3 alpha power 4. The next word was 1 alpha square alpha power 4 alpha power 6 alpha power 8 alpha power 10. I just use this construction. Okay? So, it is a generic BCH construction for a parametric matrix and you can show that if you have beta, beta square all the way to beta power d minus 1 and you do this repeatedly, repeatedly for all these things, d minus 1 or fewer columns will be linearly independent. Okay. So, the way to prove this is to assume the opposite okay. and then we will show that there is a contradiction. Okay. So, if you say, well not necessarily, we can also directly prove it, we will directly try to prove it. Okay. So, suppose I take some, uh, I do not know, some B columns okay, which are which with, with B less than or equal to D minus 1. So, let us say B is less than or equal to D minus 1 and you take columns. Okay, so I will number the columns from 0, 1, 2 all the way to n minus 1. Okay, so these are basically numbers for the columns just so that I can refer it, refer to it. So I will consider B columns, let us say I1, I2 all the way to IB. Okay, so these are basically the numbers here. Okay, so if I want to consider the first, first B columns, I will be looking at 0, 1, 2, B minus 1. Okay, so, for any other set of B, B elements here, I'll, those are the columns that I am looking at. Okay, so, I am going to pick up two B columns. So, let us look at and see if these B columns have to be linearly independent or not. So, what are these B columns? Okay, so, the B columns are actually what? Okay, so we make a sub matrix. What is the I1? IB, right? What is the I1 column? Beta power I1, beta power. 2 i 1 all the way down to beta power d minus 1 times i 1. What about the i 2 column? Beta power i 2, beta power 2 i 2 all the way down to beta power d minus 1 i 2. What is the last one? Beta power i b, beta power 2 i b all the way down to beta power d minus 1 i 2. Is that okay? That is my sub matrix. Now, I want to argue that this matrix has full column rank. Okay, so, once I do that, I know that the columns of this matrix are linearly independent and that is done. Okay. So, for that what I will do is, I will only take the first B rows. Okay, so, I will take only the first B rows. Okay, so, why would I be doing only the first B rows? Okay. So, then I get a square sub matrix and I will show that the determinant of that first B rows is actually non-zero. Okay, so the square matrices have determinant and determinant we can show is non-zero. Once you show determinant is non-zero, what is nice? The columns are linearly independent. Okay, so, once the first B rows itself has linearly independent columns, then if you add more linearly independent, it is not going to change because B itself is linearly independent, so you are okay. So, that is the strategy in showing that. So, let us look at the first B rows. Okay, so, if you do the first B rows, what do you get? You get what is known as a Vandermond matrix. Okay, so, it is a very standard matrix. Okay. So, you will get something which looks like this. Okay. A, so, so, let me add this A. So, so basically you will get beta power I1. I will write it a little bit differently. Beta power I1 squared all the way down to beta power I1 raised to the power B. Okay. So, I will write it and I will take that I1 inside and take this outside. You will get beta power I2 
beta power i2 square all the way down to beta power i2 raised to the power b right this is a simple thing so i have uh, uh, b times i1 i'm pulling i1 inside and taking b outside okay so all the way up to the last one which is beta power ib beta power ib square all the way down to beta power ib power b okay so such a structure is called the vandermorn matrix and it turns out the determinant of the vandermorn matrix has an explicit expression and what is that explicit expression okay so it turns out the determinant here is equal to product beta power ij minus beta beta power ij prime j not equal to j prime okay and i think you have to say j should be smaller than j prime or something like that so you should have some convention so that the sign is accurate but the sign i don't care about okay, plus or minus it doesn't matter so what does this give me once i know that this product is true since my order of beta was greater than n there is no way the two of these elements will be the same right no two beta i1 and beta beta ij and beta ij prime will not be equal so what does this mean this product is non zero okay i pick my beta such that the order of beta was greater than n once you have order greater than n when i take this consecutive powers there will be no repetitions beta from say beta plus 0 all the way to beta plus n minus 1 there is no repetition so here i am taking simply difference and product okay so none of these differences will go to zero so all these differences are non zero so product of them is non zero okay so that's uh, that's the way you show that if you take any b columns for b less than or equal to b minus 1 okay you can take a suitable sub matrix b by b sub matrix and show that its determinant is non zero because of this vandermorn structure okay so so how this vandermorn structure came up is by construction right so if you look at how i constructed my h i pick <coughs> i pick consecutive power powers of beta i put i pick beta beta square so on till beta to d minus 1 If I did not pick it up as consecutive, if I change the sequence, if I, if I pick like beta, then beta part three, then beta part ten, like that, then I won't get the random number matrix. Okay, I have to pick it consecutively. Only then I will get the random number matrix. Is that clear? <coughs> That's why the structure came about. Okay, and I could use the random number matrix result, result and get the beta matrix. Okay, so this is a specific construction. It's called the BCH construction, and what it gives you is powerful. Okay, it gives you this minimum distance property this basically minimum number of columns that are linearly independent okay so depend okay so let's be slightly careful it says it gives you a lower bound on the minimum distance okay so once you have this you can conclude that the minimum distance is greater than or equal to d how do you show the minimum distance is equal to d you have to actually find d columns which are linearly dependent that you may or may not be able to do depending on how it works out. but yeah in this case you can actually find say that d columns will be linearly dependent right how do you say that yeah so number of rows itself is d minus 1 so if you take d columns clearly it will be linearly dependent so 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 if you allow for coefficients from the field then you can get you can get uh, d columns to be linearly dependent but d minus 1 or fewer cannot be linearly dependent okay so that's the power of this construction and it is very generic i mean you give me an n you give me a d i can always go to a large enough field and get the units right Okay, so that's the power of how, how, how easy to use it is, and how powerful it is in guaranteeing minimum distance. Okay, yes. beta power. Correct. It's not beta by. It is the difference. Well, I mean, okay. So, so be be slightly careful. I mean, when you do these factors and all that, see, it's, it's so these are elements of a field, you know. So anything will be a factor of anything else. So you're working with the field, right? You're not working in a ring or something where some things divide, some things don't divide. Everything divides everything else. So if you're if you're working in a polynomial setting or something, or if you're working with integers, then it's interesting to show factors. But here, all my elements are field elements. Okay. So everything divides everything else. So this uh, notion of factoring factors is not very nice in the field. Okay, so there's no notion of factor. Everything divides everything else. Okay, 
only in greens this factorization becomes interesting ok. So, here I am not thinking these, be, uh, these betas as polynomial objects and all that these are entries from a field and for me factors are irrelevant from ok. Anything else? I think the uh, determinant itself will be product of beta bar all the uh, product of all the beta bar i's into the uh, product of the difference. I'm sorry? Uh, the determinant itself will be product of all the beta bar i's into the product of the difference. That is the determinant. Why? Okay, so you're saying okay. Actually, it's, I mean, I can go back and check this if you like. Maybe, maybe you need one on the top is what you are saying, ok. So, maybe, maybe the random one expression will have one on the top, ok. So, maybe there are some additional factors here, there could be some constant here or maybe some c not equal to 0 itself. So, what if, what if i1 and i2 and i b sum is divisible by n? Does not matter, right. Power of beta will never be 0, see. So, beta is non-zero, right. It will only be 1, I mean it does not matter. So, some constant is fine. Okay, so, maybe I should have just put a proportional instead of equal. Okay. See, non-zero constants up front does not make any difference. Right? It does never make it 0. So, I am only interested in differences. Okay. So, only the differences are important. Okay. Other than that, it does not matter. So, yeah, in the random one expression, maybe there is like a beta power i1, I do not know. It does not matter. So, something up front which is non-zero. So, is it okay? Okay. So, the, so I mean, there are some very nice uh, statements about random one matrix you can go look it up. So, you can also view it as a uh, like each of each of the term you can view it as a polynomial. If you think of beta as an unknown, you think of a polynomial, you can show that this essential polynomial you get in the determinant, the only factors it has are of the form x bar i minus x bar z. So, so it is a very strong result, I mean there is no way we can avoid it. Only way to make this determinant 0 is to have some two columns be identical, no other way in which you can make it. All right. So, okay. So, so I mean, this this takes a bit of digesting. So, let's lay see some examples. Okay. Let's see some examples. Okay. So, I'll start with a very simple example. We'll just pick n equals to 15, and we'll take uh, beta as uh, g of 16 primitive. Okay. So, order of beta equals 15. There is no problem, 2 and minus. Okay, suppose so I want to find say d equals uh, 3, okay, d equals 3 is a bit interesting, but we know d equals 3 is not very hard, but still let us just start with d equals 3, ok. So, what will you have? In the first row you have 1 beta, beta square all the way to beta plus 14. Second row you have 1 beta square, beta plus 4 all the way to beta plus 28, ok. So, here it is guaranteed that no two, no column is clearly 0, ok, minimum distance is not uh, 0, ok. Next you have the question of can two columns be linearly dependent in this, ok. So, it cannot be, you can prove it in various ways. One way to see it is uh, beta power i, beta power 2i and beta power 3, beta power 3, I mean, so, so things like that, I mean these two cannot be linearly dependent, right. So, what you are doing, you are doing fundamentally a non-linear operation to go from here to there, you are squaring each element to go from here to there, there is no way there will be a linear dependence, ok. So, it cannot happen, ok. So, that way you can kind of intuitively also argue that it has to be a code, it has to work out. But how do you show that three columns will be linearly dependent, ok. So, that is easy, so there are only two rows, so if you take any three columns, the rank cannot be 3, it has to be in this it cannot, it has to be 2, right. So, only two things can be linearly dependent, third one has to be a linear combination of these two. So, you can find the code, ok. So, next important thing to worry about is, so H is a parity check matrix with an entry from G of 16, ok. So, I am defining a code over G of 16 now, ok. So, what if I want a binary code, right. That might be the next question you might want to ask. I do not want a, I do not want a code over G of 16. I have a actual bits to transfer. What do I do with G of 16? I want a binary code. So, how do I get a binary code is the next question which is also equally important, ok. So, we will address that. That is where the idea of binary BCS code versus non-binary BCS codes will come, ok. So, right now we are thinking of just the parity check matrix and properties and we are not worried about 
this is whether the code you have is binary or non binary etc like let's say for instance this code is over g of 16 doesn't matter there's some alpha beta and all showing up in this code work we'll think about how to deal with it later okay so let's let's go to d so i could do d equals 4 but d equals 4 is not very interesting because i want one more error correction capability right the next step is to go to d equals 5 so here you're going to have four rows right if you go to d equals 5 i'll have four rows what are the four rows the first two rows will be the same as d equals 3 third row is going to be so if you want you can simplify these things not so crucial is that okay so that will be the characteristic matrix that you get and it has minimum distance equals 5 okay so, so that's how we go about constructing it. So, if you want, uh, you can keep keep doing this. If you want d equals seven, then you have six rows in your parity matrix, and you have d equals seven. Okay. So, like like this, you can keep proceeding for any other case. It's so it will work. Is that okay? Any questions? We're okay. So, this is the essential BCH construction, and like I said, it's 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 quite a powerful idea, and you'll see how powerful it is as we as you go along. Okay. But before we proceed, there is this confusing notion of how do you go to a binary code from this code. Okay. So it seems like the idea of a uh, finite field was quite important here. Okay. So you have to pick an element beta, order of beta greater than greater than or equal to n. Okay. So you need at least n to the order. Okay. And you are going to a larger and larger field. Okay. So how do you go to a binary field uh, from it? Okay. So that is an important question. And it turns out there are two ways of doing it. How to come back to a binary code from this codes over g of 2 power m. Okay, so there are two ways of doing it, and those two ideas give you two different kinds of constructions. Okay, so the first idea we'll see is what's called a binary BCH code. The next idea will be the non-binary BCH code. We'll go to the non-binary a bit later. It's traditional to see the binary BCH code first. So we're going to see a binary BCH code. Okay, so the idea, the main idea in the binary BCH code is to say Okay, is to do the following. Okay, so so you have so binary codes from non-binary parity check matrices. Okay, so that's the main that's the main notion that we are worried about here. Okay, there are multiple ways of doing it. Like I said, the first way we'll look at. Is, is a very simple, uh, it's, it's, it's classically the first idea that came about and for BCH codes it gives you a very nice handle on this. Okay? Suppose I have H being a n minus k cross n matrix over gf to power n. Okay? Okay, so we will restrict down to usually p equals 2. Okay? So for p not equal to 2 also you can do similar things, but usually p equals 2 is the case that is of interest in practice, so we will pitch pick that. Okay? So you can first define a code over gf2 power m. How would you do that? Set up our code words in gf2 power m n. What is gf2 power m n? What is this quantity? What is this guy? N couples from gf2 power m or the n dimensional vector space over gf2 power m ok such so, that h times c transpose equals 0 ok I could do that ok this gives me a code over gf2 power m one way to do code over gf2 is what is known as a subfield subcode idea ok so subfield subcode ok so the words suggest themselves so this idea is used in the bch code construction I am going to say I am going to look at all c's only in gf2 n ok I will not go to this gf2 power m n I only I want the code words only in that but then the condition they have to satisfy is the same ok I will not change the condition that they have to satisfy h times c transpose equals 0 that is the same there is no change in that but then I am going to only look at right code words in gf2 n 
is the reason why we have subfield is gf2 is a subfield of gf2 param why do we have subcode yeah because this will be a subcode of that it cannot be the entire code so it satisfies the same constraint so clearly it is contained that it's, it's it belongs to that code also okay so subfield so it belongs to that code also but then it will not be equal to the board okay. it will be only a subcode okay so so some questions that are important is so this guy so this code this will be an mk code right block length will be n dimension will be k what about for the subfield subcode n is all right but what about k Right? It's not clear what what k is. What is the dimension of this subfield subcode? That's not clear. Okay. So when you define a binary code from with a parity check matrix over a larger extension field, right? When you think of the bigger code over a large extension field, everything is very clear. It's a nice linear block code with the parity check matrix also coming from the same thing. It's fine. But when you want to look at its subfield subcode to define a binary code, block length will be easy, but you have to worry about dimension. It's not clear what the dimension will be. Okay. Yes, what's the question? Allowed to have a uh, RTG matrix over GF2 product, but. Uh, I mean, what is allowed? So, what is the definition of a linear block code? It's a subspace of subspace of 0, 1, n, right? Subspace of n dimensional binary code. Is this a subspace of the n dimensional binary code? Yes. So, that's your answer. You're clearly allowed to have. No, nobody is going to stop you. Right? There's no, there's nothing to stop you from that. As long as I have a subspace of 0, 1, n, I have a linear binary block code, there's no problem. How I construct it is up to me. I'm constructing here through an extension field. What does it give me? What is one of the properties of the subcode? Sub Minimum distance is still greater than or equal to the original minimum distance. Right? Right? If this is NKD, minimum distance is still greater than or equal to. Is that okay? Even for the subcode, this is the subcode, right? The entire code has minimum distance d. Only the subcode will also have a minimum distance d. Okay. So what this subfield subcode idea gives me? I mean, you might ask me, why do you go to all this trouble, go to that big field, and then come back? It gives me a guaranteed minimum distance. Okay. So in binary world, I couldn't, I couldn't do this. Right. I couldn't directly construct a d equals five. So here I have a bad parity check matrix. It is over g of sixteen. Yes. I mean, it's a bit of an inconvenience because I can't find the dimension easily. I will show you how to do it because all these problems have been overcome easily at least for the BCH codes. It is easy to overcome this problem, it is not very hard. Okay? But then I have a guaranteed minimum distance and that is much more important to me. Okay? I can correct two errors now. Previously I could never come up with a code that would correct two errors. I can correct two errors. Okay? So we will stop here for now and uh, the next class which is tomorrow we will we'll look at how to find dimensions, how to think code these problems.